Good afternoon, everyone, and welcome back. Uh, for those who did not was not in for the first portion when we were talking about uh, Willie Evelyn, Dr. Willie Evelyn Reeves, uh, we won't be uh, doing the prayer, even though I pray every time I get on Zoom that Lord uh, give me the strength so this will go correctly. And uh, the mayor, uh, he has addressed the public and tomorrow he'll be addressing the public, hopefully live, but it may be by memorets. And uh, uh, again, uh, our charity this year is the New Hope Clinic. And I see Ms. Sheila Roberts is on the line now. So without any further ado, I would like to start this program out. And uh, uh, we're about a minute or two behind, forgive me. Uh, I had to get a water and a cranberry and a few Girl Scout cookies, by the way. If you're selling Girl Scout cookies, your kids, grandkids, whatever, don't tell my wife, please. Okay, uh, this one is Battery B, 2nd Regiment U.S. Colored Troop, a U.S. Colored Light Infantry reenactment. Uh, the reason I wanted to do that, because since we started back in 2013, they have been part of the ceremony. In fact, they were part of the very first ceremony we had back in 2013. In fact, they were the color guard on that Friday night uh, when David Soselski spoke. Uh, some of the members of the group, like Sergeant Fred Johnson, he's no longer with us, and I will have a picture on him. And right now, without further ado, I'm going to start uh, my presentation. Now, please understand that the quality of the pictures may not be uh, the world's greatest reason being is the file was so large that sending at the time, and I'm an amateur, uh, I had to compress my uh, PowerPoint file, and that did a few things in there that uh, will make things a little bit herky-jerky. But uh, we will be cleaning this up. So without further ado, I'm going to start sharing my screen uh, so everybody can see what I'm seeing. And let me get the PowerPoint up here. Uh, there we go. I have to roll it back because I'm not on the very first slide. So uh, forgive me. Uh, normally uh, Liz is, is the one for that, but the file was so big I couldn't do it. And uh, so she walked me through it and she's a good teacher. Uh, the first slide you see, can everyone hear me, by the way? Okay, I assume that you can. Liz, if they can, uh, just send me a sign. Uh, it says, Battery B, 2nd Regiment, Light Artillery, United States Colored Troop. Uh, Liz, can you hear me? Well, I hope you can. Yes, Donnie, we, we can hear you just fine. Everything's good. Okay, all right. Thank you. I was nervous there. All right. Uh, Battery B. 2nd Regiment Light Artillery United States Colored Troop. Uh, that sign was not, it was done in color, but I wanted to make it like it's a little authentic, so I changed it to black and white. And underneath that, it says they served. Now, when we talk in United States Colored Troop, we're talking uh, about black soldiers during the Civil War. Uh, we all know that the Civil War was a war between the states. When I was in school, uh, what they taught me about the Civil War was that it was fought because Abraham Lincoln was to free the slaves. Uh, only until I got grown did I realize that wasn't the reason. It was both mostly fought about cotton, uh, who controlled it and where the monies went at. And the Union Army, believe it or not, was losing the war. And Frederick Douglass, uh, he went to President Lincoln and told him, he says, uh, we have men that can fight and are ready to fight. Uh, and I think you should let us fight because if you don't, you're gonna lose this war. Now, please understand one thing. There were uh, black soldiers that fought for the Confederacy also. Uh, my great grandfather was a member of the Union Army, uh, Joseph Monroe, uh, because I went to Washington DC, my wife and I, and I found his name on the, uh, around at the base of the monument. But, uh, this war uh, was a war that pitted brother against brother, a whole lot of different things. And if you ever get a chance to go to DC or look, look at that memorial. On the front of it will be 
the soldiers, Army, Navy, and all on the back would be women. Uh, okay. The first, these, this is one of the USCT uh, reenactors. Uh, this was shot last Saturday. Now, the picture quality is not the best because it was a MOV file and I changed it to a MP4 file. And also I compacted the file because I was trying to send it to Liz. And after about six or seven tries, I guess God was saying, look, you need to learn how to do this yourself. So uh, please forgive uh, anything like that because we will be cleaning it up. And when we take it to YouTube, it will sound better and the picture quality will be better. This is the first one. Okay, my name is Harvey Gooding. I work for Battery B as one of the workers on the accounting that we have. And Battery B actually originated in Virginia, uh, Fort Monroe, which is known as uh, 619, uh, 1619. Fort Monroe was actually where the yeah, banks actually first came into the United States. And when I arose, uh, Provide garrison duty for Nashville. Then we moved up to Fort Fisher and then they actually created a Fort Fisher and we came on up to Ten and Out, Museum, which we are today. And my role has uh, been first, second, third person on the cannon. Just take orders from the gunner and actually uh, you know, fire. And one of our main roles is to educate the public, which uh, many people didn't know or didn't or actually realize or don't believe uh, we had black soldiers actually fight in the Civil War. That's when our main role of giving historians to arrive there. Okay. Okay. Uh, this young man here, uh, he's Southport, uh, Joseph White. Uh, all these films were shot out, like I said, last Saturday. You can hear the, the roar of the car engines from the, uh, <laughs> from the freeway. So we're in the process of getting each one of these cleaned up, getting all the background noises out of them. And once we get it done, we'll post these so you can hear uh, all of it in its entirety in a less noisier environment. Now we're going to hear from Joseph. Say mistake name. Mm -hmm. My name is Joseph White. Um, I remember, you know, say tell the truth, that would be second U.S. artillery unit. Um, I joined this unit about 22 years ago. My brother James White got me involved, him and Marvin uh, Nicholas. And ever since then, I've been trying to let the blacks know that uh, we were a part in the Civil War. At different battles and stuff that we go to, as like at Fort Pocahontas, uh, Secession Deal at one time, Plymouth, uh, the, uh, the Battle of um, the different battles that we went to, uh, especially here at the Art Museum. This is one of our home battles that we had until an incident happened years and years ago until they stopped. So now we just do living history. We do a lot of living history all over North Carolina, South Carolina, and. Um, we tried to enlighten the black youth that we were involved. Over 185,000 um, black troops were on the Union side and over 200,000 on the Confederate side at one point in time. Um, this statue here was uh, put out here a year ago by Stephen Hayes. And as you see on the front row, you have one of our members, Marvin Nicholas. Marvin Nicholas. James White, uh, my staff is here. If you take a picture, you can see the simula simulation. We here at the Art Museum, and he took a stru structure of us, uh, and that's what the results came up. Okay, be. now this one, no, this is not First Sergeant James White. It was a case of where uh, I had made a little slight mistake uh, when I was recording it. So for about two seconds, you see some old guy with a beard and looked like uh, 
uh, he's on a, a rerun of Gilligan's Island, uh, but that's not First Sergeant James White. So. James White from Mallaby, second year school light artillery. I've been in the um, unit for probably about 20 some years. Uh, I started off when I was at the post office in Southport back in the um, 90s. Uh, when Marvin Nicholson and Charles Miller came to the post office uh, one day um, in this funny uniform, I asked them about the uniform and he told me that um, the event they was having back in, at the um, cemetery about two young, young soldiers. So um, he invited me to the event and I went um, that Saturday. And at the event, we talked after the event and he told me about the next event at Fort Fisher in Wilmington. I attended that event at Fort Fisher and um, met about 75 UCTs at that event. So the next, um, I saw Marvin was at a meeting in South Carolina and I joined the unit down in South Carolina. Um, my position is on Battery B as the uh, commander of the uh, artillery unit, the gunner. I teach the guys how to uh, do they do this to, from one to five, uh, loading the gun, firing the gun, and even misfires. Okay, that was First Sergeant James White. The last one was him. This one is a uh, Marvin Nicholson. They call him just Marvin. Marvin has been uh, a reenactor for quite a long time. Marvin's story uh, uh, encompasses it all. Uh, I apologize for the audio because uh, we had a, I guess it was a Boy Scout troop behind us. And I was, as I was filming Marvin, uh, because uh, Marvin, like myself, is getting at the age that uh, I couldn't get him to walk all the way up to the Cameron Art Museum and go in and get one of those uh, quiet rooms. So we try to shoot it outside and people, I guess they thought I had a, a nervous twitch in my hand behind me trying to tell people to be quiet. But I've learned from that. I'm gonna take a sign around me. Please, quiet, please, filming. Uh, that should solve that. So this is Marvin. Uh, and Marvin, uh, it will be speaking now. And like I said, the audio is pretty bad, but we're going to clean this up. And that's because of the number of people that was behind him looking at the statue. And uh, I guess uh, they just thought we were just sitting there and I was holding the camera up for fun. Uh, Marvin Nicholson. I live in South Carolina, Oregon, South Carolina. I remember Barbara B, second year's color light artillery. Now, one of the founding members along with James White and Fred Johnson, no, well, not Fred Johnson, James White and some of the other members, it was for uniquely, really. Um, we, we, we were, James and I were both members of. Company yeah, I, 54th yeah, Massachusetts, yeah, right. Charleston, South Carolina. Remember the famous 54th unit? It was a unit down in Charleston. And we were members of that. We were active. But we were getting, well, especially me, I was getting older. And there was always that, that concern about being able to, the mobility of my, of my body. So when it, it was suggested that maybe we, we, we should form a an artillery unit that then required the same physical uh, restraints on the body as the infantry. Well, actually, it was formed by um, Adam's battery, a white unit, a reenactment unit here in Wilmington. They were artillery, and we've been doing things with them. And so I don't know how the interest came about, how the connection, but they actually. Um, Created a mechanism for us to form an actual unit. And in fact, when we were first formed on Battery B, U.S. Cover Light Artillery, we were actually part of their um, their units because uh, that's what what, what they just have us form. We, we, we were cover troops, but we were we were provided. Actually, they provided us with the implementation, especially the cannon. 
for us I should say it was about 15, 10 or 15 years and they, they provided all of the uh, logistics for us to form the unit here and we at that time we were the only U.S. kind of light artillery in the United States in America and of course sir, we were the first Reenact color reenactment unit in North Carolina. Better be right on the border. And uh, but, but we 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 were, we were nurtured all those years by Atlas Battery and primarily Atlas Battery, but some of the other units too have to sound too. That's how we came to be prominent, uh, prominently. Recognized here in Wilmington as Battery B, 2nd U.S. Cutter Light Artillery. Uh, it, it's been a tremendous experience and it led to what we have here in Fort Road. Because that's how we Okay, you guys look here. Jay Johnson, one of our one, members. Two, three. He brought a job that. This is the battle here in Wilmington, Fort Road. Completely almost unknown the universe. Uh, had had U.S. cover troops on it. And so the museum here, the Cameron Art Museum, uh, was, was uh, instrumental in allowing us to, to um, help uh, design the first reenactment, which was extremely popular with the people the reenactors coming from Ohio, the fifth, fifth USCT, and of course other parts of the country, fifth fourth up north and all. And over the years, and this battle here at Fort Road, the Battle of Fort Road, became the now known, and it's more so known because now of the monument here. There was a monument placed here of uh, soldiers of uh, USCT, uh, members that actually fought in that battle. And of course, James Hawaii, uh, of course, from our, from our unit, has uh, an ancestor that would go directly to, uh, I think, they were participating in this battle. But the uh, Battery B here in Wilmington is recognized throughout the country right now. I don't know if there are any other USCT light artillery units or not, cover light artillery units, but we were the first and we we're very strong here in Wilmington and uh, we were carrying the torch. The United States cover troops here in Wilmington and if you go over and see the monument you'll see the, you'll see, uh, the Based on James and JoJo and myself, those are all of us that are part of this unit. That's on the monument. So uh, it, it's fabulous. It's really been a fabulous experience here. I drive religiously up from Horry County, uh, South Carolina, to participate in activities here, not only in the Battle of Fort Road, but throughout. We do other battles, of course, and of course, uh, living history activities. And, there's just lots of, lots of things here. But we, we have a real, real in, intimate relationship with the uh, Cameron Art Museum. And the other units in the area, primarily uh, Adam Special, just really been back to the reason that we're with. We we're very thankful for that. It's been a terrific experience. We're, we're formed in 2001, I believe. It was. And that was a while ago. So, we have a lot to be thankful for. Okay, sorry about that, folks. Like I said, the audio uh, was pretty bad because with everybody in the background, uh, I tried to get there early. Uh, uh, I didn't beat them there. And Marvin drive from South Carolina. So, when Marvin got there, everybody was there. So, things got a little bit noisy. And as I said, we're going to get those cleaned up. We can hear what you're looking at now is uh, one of the uh, reenactors. Uh, the first time uh, the reenactors came to Southport. Now, if you look at the picture on the left, you'll see the late Ralph Parker, his grandson beside him. And then to the left of him is Sergeant Fred Johnson. Sergeant uh, Fred, uh, he was there every year until his passing. Uh, I forget what year it was, but uh, I had the honor of attending his funeral. And I also, when he buried at the Veterans Cemetery in Jacksonville, uh, North Carolina, and the 
Uh, Battery B honored him and they were his pallbearers. I have pictures of the whole thing. I had placed them on Facebook, but uh, uh, we can't forget uh, Battery B in the history of the Black uh, History Symposium here in Southport because from the very first, and this was when David Sosowski was here and he was talking about Abraham Galloway, uh, the abolitionist who was from Southport, by the way. And uh, the color guard was United States Color Troop and it's actually a uh, Battery B, uh, I think second uh, battalion, uh, I mean, I'm sorry, Battery B, second regiment, uh, US colored light infantry reenactment. Uh, I don't want to get that wrong because James White, he won't say nothing while he's on uh, on Zoom, but he'll see me in the street and I will get an earful. And that's the picture of Sergeant Fred. Uh, he's no longer with us, nor is Mr. Parker, two great men. What you're looking at, you're looking at what I call Marvin, James, and Jojo. This picture I took uh, at the statue uh, they're the very first three on that statue called Boundless. And the thing that's the great honor for me is the fact that two of them grew up in the same neighborhood as I did. I mean, I'm older, but they grew up in the same neighborhood. And the fact that, as Marvin alluded to, that Battery B uh, has a great relationship with the Caramon Art Museum. Well, I want to make that also that Battery B has a great relationship with the city of Southport and the Southport uh, Black uh, History Symposium. But uh, these three, their likeness. Now, uh, when it really sinks in, this statue will be around long after they're gone. Maybe long after their kids are all gone. But it's there. Uh, they were on there. The first three. Uh, it was a moving moment. I was there in November when they did the first dedication. I mean, it was, uh, you could hardly hear, but Marvin talked about uh, a date that uh, it should be for everybody in Southwood should be important. And that date was February the 7th, 1998. And that's when they honored Abram Blunt and Abram Galloway at John Smith Cemetery and Marvin told me, he said, he had never seen that many reenactors, both Confederate and Union. It was a great event, but I can't find many pictures. So any of you out there are listening, if you were there at that event, if you have pictures, please, please, by all means, uh, get in contact with me. Uh, if you don't have my email address or whatever, just drop it a line on this uh, uh, Zoom and I'll get it back to you because we would love to have those because that is part of Southwest history. They honored two African-American soldiers. And according to James, that was the reason he joined. So if you do have that, please let us know. This was the uh, picture that was out. It was on the brochure. What you're seeing that was inside of the gray, that's the way the picture was. And the mere fact that the first three on there, just behind the drummer, was from Battery B, and two of those of Battery B were actually from Southport, and we have Marvin Nicholson, because Marvin is, he's a historian in his own right when it comes to uh, United States Colored Troops, and we got told Marvin, I got to get him to Southport. What you're looking at there, these ladies were like the Missionary Society, because back in the day, they were the ones that educated, were some of the first to educate Blacks in the South. And these ladies were dressed up in their missionary outfits. And as I was getting off of the bus, I caught the bus over. I walked back. I probably should have caught the bus back, but I walked back anyway. And uh, they were out there. This is, was taken in November of last year at the uh, dedication ceremony uh, to the statue that's housed on the ground of Battle of the Forks Road uh, called Boundless. This is where the battle took place. Now, Chris Farnville, 
I hope I'm announcing his name right because I'm going to try to get him here now. I don't want him to be angry with me. Uh, he discovered this uh, and he wrote a book on it. And the book is called, if you hear the rattling, I just took it out of my uh, bag. It says, Glory at Wilmington, the Battle of Forks Road. This battle was fought with United States colored troops as the main focus. Uh, and it was there. Now, uh, I got the book on Boundless because on the back of the statue uh, is the name of all those who served and fought at the Battle of the Forks Road. And I started looking in there and I looked and I saw Abram Blunt's name. I knew my great grandfather wasn't going to be in there uh, because he didn't join until March the 1st. But I was shocked at some of the names. Now, the name again came up as John Jackson. I believe it's John Jackson. Yeah, I'm, uh, let's see here. Uh, was it in this one? Or hold on, I'm looking at, at it right now. Uh, once is John Jack. No, that was in another one. But I ran across a name that says Henry Joyner. And it's spelled the way my great paternal great grandfather spells his name, but I'm not for sure that's him. But rest assured, I will be looking now. But one of the names that came up that uh, was surprising, and then again, it wasn't surprising, was the name of Caesar Evans. And if there's anybody who's kin to the Evans on this, uh, on this Zoom, Caesar Evans uh, was from around Plymouth, and he settled in Bolivia. And by him being in that battle, that's more than likely why he settled down here. And so I'm getting with Miss Marion Evans. She's a, a historian in her own right, and I'm sharing this information with her because he was probably at the Battle of the Forest Road. On the back of that statue, there's quite a few names on the back of it. Uh, and if you haven't been to the Cameron Art Museum, go. It doesn't cost you anything to see the uh, uh, the uh, this, this memorial. It's because it's out on the grounds. So you don't have to worry about paying any money. Uh, but you should go in the gift shop, maybe buy some. This picture was taken in November. That's Joseph White. Uh, as they say, uh, he was uh, talking with a, a lady there. And his brother James is in the background. And that's Jim McKee. He's got a little gray hair now. And I think he's growing some on his bald, I mean, on his uh, uh, closely cropped head. Uh, these guys have been doing this more than 20 years. Not only here, I've seen pictures of them in downtown Raleigh. I've seen pictures in James' scrapbook in South Carolina, Virginia, all over. They are very serious at what they do. Uh, I learned a lot about their uniforms. One is the shoes. It's the same, it's not a left shoe or right shoe. So I guess if you were sleeping, had your shoes off, had to get up real quick. Uh, you know, some people say, wait a minute, you got on the wrong shoe. You wouldn't have on the wrong shoe because they're all the same in their outfits. Uh, they were designed uh, for, for a battle in whether it's cold or hot. And I know in the summertime, those outfits are really warm. This right here is the statue. Uh, the gentleman carrying the flag in the front, uh, he was there. So we got to look at him. And as you see the drummer, uh, and then behind the drummer, there's Marvin, Joe, uh, James, and Jojo. These were, uh, these are Buffalo soldiers. Now, I met the same group of Buffalo soldiers in Southport when at the Maritime Museum, when we were doing a dedication of the Black uh, Naval Display, and they donated money to help us get that uh, mannequin and all down to uh, Maritime Museum. And when I saw them, I said, uh, I remember you guys. And so they stopped, and they were gracious enough to pose for me. And uh, that was a shot. I like that shot. This is Stephen Hayes. He is the architect. He is the man that did the sculpture. Uh, young man, uh, he did a wonderful job. And when they named it, it all it said was boundless. And uh, it says United States Colored Troop Public Sculpture Project at the Cameron Art Museum. And he did a wonderful job. Now he had some good posers for him. And 
right there, as you can see, some of them are standing beside the statue. There's Joseph, and there's Marvin. Uh, they're standing there and people are taking their pictures when they find out that they're the ones in the actual statue. Now, for those who, who haven't grasped the significance of that, you are alive. Your image is cast on a statue. Most time when people's images are cast on a statue, they're not around. They're dearly departed. Now this right here is James, and I don't know who this, this soldier is. This is one that, the, uh, a picture that I, I took and I sort of tried to blur the ones in the background. Uh, uh, James is very serious at his craft. He doesn't say very much. I wish he did sometime, but uh, uh, he's like, you got men of action and you got men of words. And uh, I like that picture. That's a very good picture. And uh, the good thing about it is I don't like to worry too much about uh, getting permission with that. Now, that was the, uh, the slides in there. I left room because I believe that James and some of the others are online. And I'd like to get them. <laughs> uh, James, are you there? Uh, Joseph, well, if not, I guess I can uh, I can fill in the other part. Uh, James, is, James is on here, Donnie. Uh, yeah, I, I knew I saw him on there. James, where are you? Oh, no, wait a minute. He, that's right. He, he's driving. Uh, oh, I think right. I saw Joseph on here. Are there James, any other? James, James is on, but he's at the hospital. My mother fell. Oh my God, I, I'm so sorry. Yeah, so he's at the hospital. All so, right. but he's right. on. Thanks, Regina. Thanks, mm -hmm. Regina. Uh, mm -hmm. Regina is uh, James and JoJo's oldest sister. I'm so sorry. We're we're praying for uh, Mary. Mm -hmm. uh, that's their mother. You know, that's uh, I hate when in time I hear anything like that. But uh, the thing about Battery B and these young men, for years they have told the story of. Blacks in the Civil War. When I was in school, I never heard that story, but uh, they have told it uh, in words, actions, and deeds. And uh, I really uh, appreciate that. Uh, as I said a little earlier, there are a couple of books that you might want to get. One of them is called Glory at Wilmington. This is a book that Chris Farmville, Jr., uh, wrote about the Battle of the Forks Road. Uh, this battle was uh, was fought in Wilmington. It was near the end of the war uh, in 1865. Uh, Wilmington, believe it or not, uh, was the last stronghold for the Confederacy because what happened is the uh, Confederacy, their supply, any war fought, you got to have a supply line. And their supply chain was at one time, I think it was Richmond, and then it was around Charleston and Savannah areas, all like that. And the Union troops had already gone in and busted that up, uh, paraphrasing uh, Chris. And so Wilmington, uh, according to Chris, Wilmington was the turning point in the war. Whoever captured Wilmington would win the war. And it showed how, uh, like the blockade runners, we all know about the blockade runners coming down uh, into the Wilmington area, uh, bringing supplies. Because once you got into Wilmington, you had wagon roads, trains, and all that, that you could get supplies north to Virginia or either down south. But once the uh, Union Army took that, uh, the battle was basically over with and the Battle of the Forks Road. Now, a lot of times when you don't find any information on the Battle of the Forks Road, Chris named the battle. I mean, the battle did occur there. Uh, they had enough people come in, the battle was there. They knew who fought in there from records, going back in the research. And if anybody uh, who knows Chris, he is very thorough in his research. Uh, you know, he's a, he's, he's a guru when it comes to uh, history. Uh, battle history. I bought several of his books. Uh, every dime I paid for them was well spent. Uh, and uh, I was just so fascinated about it. Uh, the Battle of the Forks 
uh, road, because he named it that, is the mere fact that I could sit back and look and I could identify some of the people that was in that battle. And uh, like Caesar Evans. And Caesar Evans, later on, he, uh, he bought land in Bolivia. His son, Robert, was an attorney. The Evans still live in Bolivia. And it makes you proud when you know that you have relatives that fought for this country to make it what it is. And my great grandfather, Joseph Monroe, I'm very proud of him because he joined in March, the same time that Abram Galloway, uh, who is also buried at uh, John Smith Cemetery, joined. And the reason why his name is Abram Galloway is because Abraham Galloway, the abolitionist, they had the same name. One was born in Southport and one was born in the Royal Oak section of supply. Uh, the local call it Royal Oak. And Abram Galloway, who was born in the Royal Oak section, actually moved to Southport uh, after the war. Later on, he settled in Southport. Abram Blunt, whose name is on the back of that statue, he was born in Plymouth, North Carolina. But, uh, and that's why I was so fascinated when I saw he was at the Battle of the Forks Road, is he stayed here. In fact, he married a local, uh, Mr. James Frank, my uh, uh, English teacher. He married Mr. Frank's great aunt. Uh, and he was a member of Mount Carmel Church, the same as Abram Galloway, the uh, soldier, USCT soldier, who is buried at John Smith. In fact, uh, when I found out that Abram Galloway was because it said uh, death date 1927. And earlier, before I moved back home, I saw what it said. Someone told me, it says, well, Abraham Galloway is from Southport and he's buried in Southport. So I go, wow, that's amazing. So when I got home, I contacted my old classmate and friend, Judy Gordon. I said, Judy, where's his grave? And when she took me to his grave, it had a Civil War era headstone on it. And I looked at it and I looked down and I saw the date that he was interned in the cemetery. I said, that's not uh, Abraham Galloway. And she said, why? I said, because the abolitionist Abraham Galloway died in in 1870. Now, no one knows where he's buried because I spoke with uh, Harry, who was a curate, I forget Harry's last name, at the uh, uh, museum in Washington, D.C. They said back then, if it was a spy, what they would do is they would bury him in an unknown location because people would try to, uh, they had grave robbers back then. So, uh, but the gentleman buried at John Smith is not the abolitionist. Even in the uh, NCpedia, they have it wrong because when I clicked on uh, Abraham Ga Abram Galloway's name, it shows the abolitionist and said he died in 1870. So uh, I know that's wrong. But uh, uh, there's a rich history in the black community uh, when it comes to United States colored troop. And uh, Chris unlocked another door that was there all the time and I didn't know it, uh, that helps me out uh, in my history of that, you know, and uh, if you get a chance, there's a little booklet it's called Boundless. I mean, you know, you're, uh, you're paying for, don't worry about the price of it, but it's a, it's a very good book. Uh, it gives you a lot of information about how they did the statue, uh, about the Battle of the Forks Road. And again, the uh, I'm, I, uh, I'm truly uh, sorry and I'm praying for James's mother uh, who fell. So uh, that part uh, we'll have to do at some other time. But uh, these guys do a wonderful job. And most people, like myself, years ago, had no idea what a U.S. colored troop was. And then you had, after that, you had the Buffalo Soldiers. Uh, and uh, there are still some of the old ones from World War II, I think, still living. Uh, but if you ever get a chance, go over to Cameron Museum, or either you just go on and Google Boundless, 
it'll show how it was done because these guys had to be in a cast, uh, I think all the way down to their shoulders for hours and not moving. That's got to be uncomfortable. You know, and you've got all that cast on there and then they take it off. Uh, it was It's a statue that you should see. And on the back is a list of everyone who fought in that battle. And there's a lot of names. Uh, I will take questions uh, in, in honor of the group uh, since uh, this emergency. Does anyone have any questions? Good. Uh, okay, well, no one has any questions. Uh, Donnie, I wanna, Donnie yeah. James, James did unmute himself. I don't know if he's available. Uh, yeah, I think Regina said he's at the hospital. I know. I just didn't know why he took the mute off. I thought maybe he Yeah, was, yeah. I thought I saw Marvin. Or, well, I know Jojo won't be there. Mar Marvin's on. Marvin, are you there? Uh, he might be trying to unmute himself. He's still muted as Marvin, not muted. Let's see. Can Marvin, you can you hear me? Yeah, I can hear you now. Marvin. Okay. Uh, uh, why don't you give us a little, uh, you know, we really appreciate you guys being on. Uh, and like I said, the noise behind us when I was trying to uh, do it at the uh, museum, how about uh, just giving us a little insight of a uh, battery B? Well, you, you, you have covered quite thoroughly and certainly you can get a great deal of um, understanding and insight from uh, Chris Fonville's uh, writings on the battle, and of course other other authors, other information. But um, it was, and just like you said, uh, terribly significant in the fact that it was really you could could call just about the last battle of the war. Now we know this was set um, February, and the war didn't end until <clears throat> a couple of months later, but. Um, since uh, Robert E. Lee couldn't get the supplies that he depended on from Europe through Fort Fisher, and of course, Wilmington, and uh, the, the, the Confederate unit that was defending Wilmington is the ones that, that the USCTs encountered. And when they capitulated the city of Wilmington, that means those supplies were cut off, like as you referred to, and they couldn't reach uh, the Army of Northern Virginia, uh, Robert E. Lee's Army in, uh, for the North and inland. But the fact that um, there's a lot of locality here, and I have to count myself local. Uh, Horry County, South Carolina is just a couple, less than two hours from, from Wilmington, uh, just west of Myrtle Beach in Conway, some of you may know. And uh, I've just uh, made myself a part of this because it's so interesting. And it's like I said, it's local, it's like personal. I get involved with all you guys at Southport. Every time I come to Southport for an event, and I've come to quite a few. Uh, we've done some some, some pr uh, parades and campouts and different things, and uh, I, I, it, it's really marvelous. And getting to to meet folks like you all, you know, that are interested, that can share in this in this uh, experience in history that sort of short. Now I'll, I'll tell you, I'm sixty. I'm eighty five years old. I'm a retired public school administrator, and I didn't know any of this. I didn't know that U.S. I didn't even know there were color people in the Civil War, and uh, until um, I retired many years ago from the public school system, and became uh, involved in the hobby that is called reenactments, uh, Civil War reenactments, and um, through my own research and, and my involvement with other with others over a period of over some 25 years, I've just amassed such a tremendous amount of understanding. And the key thing is, for me, is understanding. Because I will tell you now, uh, the more, of course, the more, the more you learn, the more you realize you don't know. Uh, about the South, especially, this, it's, it's such an intricate history. No question about it. In the, in, on the North American continent, known as the United States of America, the southern part, we call it the South, we know in the Southeast, basically. That history 
is just so far ahead of other the reasons of the kind of the West, the North, the uh, New England, all that, in its complexities. And that's that's what I'm learning. I'm learning so much about how uh, even during during the antebellum period and b- before the Civil War, and then during the Civil War, then of course post Civil War, uh, Reconstruction, post Reconstruction, leading up to Plessy Ferguson, all that. Uh, it, it, the, it's a whole picture, and I like to I like to use this uh, term. I like to say, I like to look at our history now, uh, like from a, not like a from A to Z. You 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 start with our history and you say, well, our history was was all about slavery and uh, all blank blank. That's like going from A to Z. Well, with, with all with what, what I've learned. And what I am learning, I learn all the time, every day, is that um, there is, between A and Z, there are a lot of letters, or some 24 letters. And that's, and in each one of those letters, that can be a part of our history. And I can tell you now that most Americans, unfortunately, do not know. And of course, they fail to be able to understand the complexity of our history here in the South which is just marvelous. And that's why I'm so glad I, I can be part of this. Thank you very much for having me, um, Danny. Marvin, thank you. Uh, you know, like I said, uh, uh, James introduced me to a lot of people and you were one and you one of the ones that is uh, James admires and respect. And Marvin, I got to tell you, I didn't realize you were that old. Oh my goodness, but you don't look it. Uh, I was looking at Marvin was talking. I was looking inside the little book called Boundless. And this was a quote that Stephen Hayes uh, did. And he said, and I quote, as a black man in America, I see the image of a black person in chains being whipped, begging, kneeling, and helpless. This project is important to me because as a creator, I get the chance, uh, get to uh, change that narrative by giving black soldiers a sense of honor and pride. And I thought that was a very good quote. And uh, I do know because growing up, a lot of my, I was never in the military, but a lot of my uh, ancestors and relatives served in the military and they always served with pride. Uh, I had an uncle that was a drill sergeant. Uh, He passed away in 1956 uh, due to, he had what's called a goiter. Uh, and uh, I've had relatives. Like I said, my great grandfather was in the Civil War. My uh, great uncle was in World War One. I. I had uncles in World War Two, cousins and all in Korea, Vietnam. Every scrimmage that been in America, there's someone on the Monroe side of my family, as well as the Joiner side of my family, that's fought in these wars, and they all fought with a sense of pride. Uh, it's like when I said the Pledge of Allegiance, it's like uh, automatic because when you're in school, that was one of the things they taught you uh, to say the Pledge of Allegiance. And if you said it and when you said it, you had to say it like you meant. It. And that's one of the things uh, growing up in school. Now, there's a lot of things that we were not taught. Don't get me wrong. <laughs> I'm not saying everything was rosy and all that. There was a lot of things that we were not taught. There were things that was taught to our parents that by the time we got in school, they were dropped from the curriculum. And they do that every day. And I'm so thankful that Marvin was able to get on. Uh, Like I said, I've known Marvin for a long time. James, I've known him all of his life, his family, because we all grew up on one little road. Uh, It was called Jabba Town Road. And James is, he's dedicated. he doesn't say much, uh, but if you ask him to do something, he will get it done because the very first Black History event we had, I asked James when I found out that he was a Civil War act, reactor, an act, an actor, reenactor, I'm sorry. Uh, I asked him, I said, I need to get some soldiers from the old days. And so he said, well, let me call the guys and see what we can do. And Marvin and all of them, and there was a picture uh, I've got about 20,000 pictures, and that picture was way back there. It had, I think, Marvin, uh, JoJo, Sergeant Fred, and James, and one other gentleman on there. 
And uh, to this day, I am deeply grateful and I have a lot of gratitude for them. And Marvin uh, did tell me about the event on, uh, like I said, February the uh, 7th, 1998. Uh, it took place here in Southport. Uh, but all of this is to say that, say this one thing. As people, we're Americans, we're all Americans. I know we say we're Black Americans, we're Italian Americans, we are, but we're just Americans because there was a, a little funny story. Uh, my wife and I, we were not, we were headed to Bermuda. We were on the plane from Philadelphia. And so what they did was they said, okay, uh, they had alien, they had alien cars to be filled out. When we got off the plane, there was 130 of us on the plane. There were only three Americans on that plane. The rest of them were German, Irish, uh, Russian, and everything else. And when they we depart, when we uh, got off the plane, uh, they were sending them to a place that they were going to actually quarantine them. And then this one girl's mother, you're an American. She said, but uh, I'm Irish descent. She said, I understand that, but you're American. So... Uh, it's always good because with me, after going through ancestry, I'm about five, six, or seven different uh, groups. But as America, we're all Americans. When one of us is hungry, we're all hungry. And until we learn to look at it this way, don't look at it in the light of a politician. Uh, I don't carry a conservative card in my pocket. I don't carry a liberal card in my pocket. If any card I carry, it's the American card in my pocket. And the sooner we find that out, the better off we'll be. I mean, you look at things in different parts of the world, things that are happening today and all that. When you look back in times of war uh, in the black community, and for years uh, we were in slavery, uh, they still fought. The first one to die in the Revolutionary War, I think, was Crispus Adams, Atticus, black man. Uh, James uh, and Jojo's great great grandfather, uh, Richard Davis, fought in the Revolutionary War. We found that. Uh, it's amazing. And Richard Davis's descendants, since then, there's been a Davis in just about every war. And this is why it's so important that when we honor uh, these soldiers uh, and a lot, because they did a job that most of us could not do. It's easy to say what you could do, uh, but it's difficult when you have to do it. Uh, the, uh, the armed forces, we used to watch the big picture on TV, people jumping out of airplanes. Wow, that looked like fun. It looks like fun because you're not doing it. Jump out of one. And, and see if you like it. Maybe that might change your mind. But uh, I've always tried to put something about our military in each one of our Black history events because we've had a lot of Blacks to serve in the military. Uh, there have been a lot that have won the Congressional Medal of Honor. And I think in the Civil War, uh, one of them was named Christian Fleetwood. I think he has three or four uh, he won in battle. He was a sergeant. Uh, and whenever you get a chance, check out books on the United States Colored Troop. And you'll find that for a while they got paid less than the uh, white Union soldiers. Uh, and most of the time, like on that statue I was telling you about, on the United States Colored Troop, you'll see there's soldiers. There's a sailor and there's army and all that. And then there is a young man who played the drums on there. But on the back of that statue is something that most people never pay attention to. And I did. And you know what that was? That was a picture of women and children. The women during the Civil War, they went to the camp. They were the ones that did the cooking, the washing, and all that. And also, the women were the ones who actually, they were some of the best spies. Because... They had them as uh, as servants, and so it depends on how they'd hang the clothes on the line or whatever would also tip the Union soldiers if there was Confederate troops nearby 
uh, if there was some big dignitary and all that. And it's just amazing when you start studying history. And uh, again, I wanted to thank the uh, uh, Battery B 2nd uh, Regiment uh, uh, Colored Light Artillery uh, reenactors. And I'm praying for uh, Mary uh, James's mother that everything is all right because it's one thing about Jabba Town Road, we're all one family. Uh, I go to Mount Kama, he goes to Brown's Chapel, but we all one family. And so that's all I have. Uh, again, I would like to thank our sponsors uh, uh, of the event, because if it wasn't for our sponsors, it would not uh, occur. And those sponsors are the Brunswick Arts Council, North Carolina Arts Council, City of Southport, Southport Tourism, and Southport Historical Society. Uh, special thanks to Marvin Nichols uh, for his participation to all of the uh, Civil War reenactors. And I got to put a plug in for uh, my good friend, Joseph White. Uh, he was quite an athlete. In fact, at Livingston College, which is an HBCU, he is in their Hall of Fame. Uh, uh, so these guys have more than one job. And Joe is an educator, and he, uh, I think he was a coach. Uh, in school, so uh, they do more than just reenact, and most of the time that money is out of their pocket. Now, Cameron does help, uh, with their expensive because sometimes a lot of them travel from a long ways. Uh, but uh, whenever you get a chance, if you're here in town, come by and show you your support. Now, tomorrow is the closing, and we're gonna have the uh. What we know is known as the uh, Gospel Fest, which will be hosted by uh, Win Win uh, Win Worthen. and uh, I think you're going to enjoy this. And like a lot of other things, it's by Zoom, so it's not the effect of when you're live. Because if you've never been to a Black History Gospel Fest when it's live, you miss something. And uh, I, I just want to say thank you. And is uh, Ms. Roberts still on the line? Uh, if she is, do you see her, Liz? Yeah, I'm here. Uh, Sheila Roberts, uh, I'd like if you would say a word because the charity that we're donating money to this year is the New Hope Clinic. So, Sheila, could you say a few words? Uh yeah, thank you. Thank you so much. Uh, it's been a great program yesterday and today, and I'm looking forward to tomorrow. Thank you for selecting New Hope Clinic as the charity of choice for this year. Uh, the stories from earlier today with Dr. Reeves were so close to home with caring for your families and, and helping people achieve more. So at New Hope Clinic, we're trying to make sure that everyone can get access to healthcare when they're uninsured and don't have enough income, don't have an employer who can provide that insurance for them so that we can get medical, dental, pharmacy services. So anything that you all can do to keep supporting us through donations or volunteers at our Boiling Spring Lakes or our Shalote Clinic, or just please help someone connect to us who's in need of healthcare. So thank you for your, your wonderful stories today and for your support. Thank you, Ms. Robert. And again, uh, don't forget tomorrow uh, at three o'clock is the Gospel Fest. That concludes our Black History Symposium weekend. And please, what if, if you can spare, whether it's penny, nickel, dime, quarter, uh, $100 bill, $2,000 bills or whatever, they can use it because it's, it's good work. And let people know that they're out there in Boiling Spring Lake. And Liz put up the information on the slide a little earlier uh, for those who would like to go online to do it because uh, it is truly a good organization because people need health care. Right now, a lot of people have lost their jobs due to COVID and a lot of people have lost their jobs due to the fact that uh, the thing is called uh, modernization. In other words, uh, people that used to make uh, saddles for horses a lot of them went out of business when the car came along. And every year, the more we learn, the more uh, technology comes about, somebody's going to lose a job. If you don't keep up with the times, that was the, the thing about Dr. Reeves. 
she was telling her family, you got to be educated because if you're not, you're going to wind up uh, behind the, excuse me, the language, the eight ball. There's the slide right there, New Hope Clinic. Uh, Liz, leave that up there for a few minutes and I will uh, talk so that uh, they can see it, where to send that at. And remember, you know, it may be, as they sometimes say at a funeral, uh, today is them, tomorrow it may be you. And you never know when you're going to need help, especially with medical help, because there are so many out there with insurance, people that can't afford insurance. And if you don't know where to go and which way to turn, uh, that's a problem in itself because uh, our nation, for it to survive, a strong nation has a better chance to survive in than a weak nation and a godly nation. When you put God first, uh, you're ahead of the game because I always tell my daughter, there's three things to remember. There's God, family, and education. As long as you keep God on top, the family and the education, you can switch them any way you want. But you've got to remember that because on our money, it says, in God we trust. And that's what we need to make sure that we stick to, in God we trust, not man. All right. Well, anyway, again, thank you. And don't forget, tomorrow, Sunday, February 27th, at the hour of 3 p.m., we will have the Gospel Fest. We hope to see you on. If you're not, it will be on Facebook Live, and I'll post it on my Facebook page, and I believe a little later after we uh, do a few things with them and clean some of them up, we'll put them on YouTube. But again, whatever you can send, uh, if you have some expertise that they may be used, contact uh, Mrs. Roberts and the organization and uh, give a helping hand. Because it is true, we are our brother's keepers. Well, everyone, uh, I want to say uh, thank you again. Thank you for the audience. Good night. Uh, yes, I'm having a Girl Scout cookie. And again, do not tell my wife. If any of your kids, grandkids, great-grandkids has uh, Girl Scout cookies, don't tell them. Uh, because she loves Girl Scout cookies. And I told her not to buy so many. So what I do to try to help her out, I eat them every once in a while. It's not that I like Girl Scout cookies. Okay? Well. We're going to say goodbye. I just saw James' uh, face pop up. I'm going to call James in a minute. Marvin, good seeing you, man. Uh, Y'all take care. And, uh, oh, there's Miss Ferguson. Uh, and uh, take care and look in tomorrow. And for those who have Black history or knowledge, please let us know. We'll be glad to. We don't mind sharing. And we would love to hear your stories because uh, we have just touched the surface. Of it. It's sort of like your brain. They say we only use 10% of our brains and maybe some of it use less than that. But anyway, y'all have a, a great night and don't forget New Hope Clinic. When you go to bed tonight, New Hope Clinic. And if you're not in North Carolina, uh, the mail still works, New Hope Clinic. Uh, 